Hi everybody, uh, welcome to our next podcast um, in this series. Um, my name is Heidi Probst. I'm joined today in the room by some uh, the colleagues. And we have. Uh, yeah, my name's Kath Holborn and I work, work as a lecturer in radiotherapy and oncology. And my name's Janet Ullman and I'm a PhD student. Uh, it's lovely to have you both here today. So today uh, we have been reviewing, or we are going to review, um, an article called, the title of the article is Further Than the Eye Can See, Photo Elicitation and Research with Men. And the authors are, I'll pronounce these wrong and I apologise, Oliffy and Bortoff. And the journal is uh, Qualitative Health Research, um, and I'm just trying to find the actual, uh, do we have the volume numbers? Yeah, just at the start there. Oh, at the start? Yeah, volume 17, number 6. Oh, perfect, thank you, Carl. 2007. Yeah. 2007. So, um, the reason we've chosen um, this article today is because um, we think it's a really interesting research method and we thought it would be really helpful for students to um, have a, a little bit more insight into this as a, as a possible um, method that they might want to use in research in the future. Now normally when we do these podcasts what we uh, tend to do is do a, a brief summary of the research itself and then we spend most of the time um, talking about the quality of the research and opportunities for bias just so that we can help students or anybody who's new to um, critical appraisal of research articles get a feel for different things to look for in a research article because no, no research project is perfect. It's, we're doing research with humans usually and so there's always opportunities for bias and it's just a way of us helping people understand some of the things to look for. I'm going to turn it around a little bit this time because it's slightly an unconventional report in that respect and that the focus of the article is really about the research method and, and its benefits uh, for studying aspects of cancer care and the cancer patient experience. So what I'd like to do instead is do a very brief summary of the reporting of the article and some of the um, information that we aren't able to glean, mainly because it, it wasn't the focus of the, the publication. But just to give you a highlight of, of some of the things where there could have been opportunities for, for bias, but really the most the focus of this paper is really about the benefits of photovisual methods, and that's what we'd like to focus on is really the content and have a discussion about that if that's okay. So I'm just going to um, uh, quite briefly talk around some of the issues that we've used the COREC um, 32. Um, checklist as a tool just to help us with the quality assessment. It's a commonly used checklist uh, a reporting tool for um, for um, researchers actually when they're wanting to publish qualitative research. It's a useful guide to make sure that they've covered lots of important areas. So it covers, if you've not seen it before, um, things around does the, does the article report the credentials of the um, authors and that really gives the reader some indication of their, um, you know how well trained they are to do do the work. It also asks about um, gender because that might have an influence on how the results are analysed. If it's very um, push push to one one gender, actually this the authors are it's equally divided um, between male and female. Um, it asks about what experience or training the researchers have, and that's not detailed in this article, but it's useful in qualitative research to explain what the expertise of the authors are. Um, it also asks about what the relationship is between the participants and the um, authors. So it's really important to look for whether um, the researchers were involved in the care of those patients in any way because that can be a huge power imbalance. Um, and this wasn't, I don't think it was explicitly detailed in the article, but it's, um, it, it's kind of clear that they weren't involved in treatment of the patients um, as you read through it. Um, it also asks about how or was a relationship established prior to the study commencement, but there was a quite a good actually, it wasn't explicitly stated, but it's a, it, it, as you read through the article you can get a feel for how they um, developed understanding with, with participants and, get, and developed that trust um, throughout the process of the, of the research. Um, participant knowledge of the interviewer, we're not sure, it's not detailed in the article. Um, and moving on to the study design, um, it asks what was the methodological orientation and the theory. And again, it wasn't explicitly stated in the methods section, um, but they do talk about um, uh, theories as they go through, and one of those being gender. 
um, and that's clearly quite an important part of the analysis and the driving force of the research. Um, they used um, convenient sampling. Um, they uh, recruited from uh, support groups, uh, newspaper adverts, etc. And that will have some impact on um, the sample that they were able to, re to um, consent for the study. Um, we're not, um, it's not clear um, where all of the data was collected um, and that's a useful bit of information to know again if, just in, in for future references, if you're doing a qualitative study and you um, take most of the data and um, collection is done at the hospital site, that can have an impact on how uh, the participants feel because they can associate the hospital with um, a power imbalance and maybe they're not as comfortable or relaxed and open uh, in maybe a neutral environment. So that's reason, that's one of the things to remember when, when you're doing qualitative research. Um, uh, what else can I tell you that's important? Um, the the, the ch current ch uh, checklist asks about the interview guide and whether that's included in the publication. Um, and there wasn't really a very, there wasn't a structured interview guide and I think that's one of the, that will come out is the, um, one of the benefits mm -hmm. of this method. It was very much um, participant led, so um, the questioning was very open and that's really, I think that makes the strong um, uh, quality aspect to the study is it's, um, it puts the emphasis very much on the participants and not the research driven element. Um, one of the questions it does ask about audio-visual methods for recording, obviously it's mainly um, visual data, but there were interviews and it's not, I'm not clear, um, I know they took field notes, but I wasn't clear whether they audio recorded. I only know because I referred back to the original yeah. piece of work, oh, it was right. somebody's, is this chap's um, PhD thesis, so yes he did, did. take record. Oh right, that's yeah. excellent. And that's a really good thing to do actually, is to go back and read the, which I didn't. <laughs> It's a really good I think to do is go back and read the, the other piece of work that's linked to it, which they do refer to actually. Um, they, it, the the COIC checklist asks of whether the data there was saturation. Um, and again, it wasn't the focus of this publication. And data saturation um, is a very difficult concept. Some researchers don't really um, believe that you can ever reach data saturation. You could keep interviewing and um, including more and more patients and still get new new information. Data saturation really means um, at the point at which you don't get any more new information other than the themes that have already been developed. Um, so it's a very difficult area, there's a lot of uh, writing on that subject alone. So, um, uh, so while the authors may not have talked about data saturation, I think it's quite a complex issue mm. actually. Can I just say at that mm. point, I'm wondering, because the approach was participant led if you yeah, like yeah. and it just happened that there were 19 participants out of the 35 in the entire study who opted to use photographs so it was kind of driven by that part it was rather yeah. than keep yeah because they have 35 in the study to, yeah. to, to access yeah um uh, it also asks about how many data coders were used in the data and i wasn't clear um that's usually helpful to know from a researcher perspective, whether it was what you're looking for, is it just one person? Because you sometimes may get researcher bias if you've just got one individual researcher coding all of the data, or whether um, it's shared. And in, in a PhD, if it's a PhD study or a student project, usually um, you will get a peer review from the supervisor um, or somebody else in the team, and that's helpful to remove some of that potential bias. And it wasn't clear, but again, we've talked about why that's not been documented here. Um, it, one of the things is were themes identified in advance or derived from the data? I think they're absolutely derived from the data. Um, I, there was no, um, I, I wasn't clear that they were, they'd identified the themes beforehand. Um, one thing that's um, really, again, important in qualitative research is something called participant checking or member checking. Um, and I, I wasn't clear how, um, did they go, sometimes you can go back to the, um, participants when you've done your thematic analysis and ask them, the participants, if they think it's a true reflection of, of the interview. Um, and again, mainly because this study was very participant-led, maybe they, that wasn't um, undertaken. And again, there was a lot written about um, the value of member checking um, and how, how well participants do engage in that. That's a whole different topic. Um, but there wasn't, it wasn't explicitly mentioned in the method section. Um, about whether they did participant checking. 
Um, so there's lots of things on the COREC, COREC uh, 32 checklist that I felt I wasn't able to, to pinpoint um, in the article, but I think there is good reason probably because of the focus of the article. So I probably would leave it there, but I hope I've highlighted um, just a few areas where if you're looking at a qualitative research, they're important to consider when you're doing critical appraisal. And I think what I'd like to um, move over to and spend a bit more time on is the, the, the content of the article and the research method um, that was adopted, this photo elicitation, especially in this particular um, group of individuals, so um, in, in, in men, um, and, uh, and the value really of, uh, of using this as, as, as a way of encouraging men to talk about their experiences and they highlight in the article particularly how a lot there is a lot written about gender differences in terms of how we respond to um, experiences and how much we talk about things and these kind of stereotypes with men that if you are open and you talk about your feelings that's somehow a sign of weakness and how this is one of the reasons why they use this method um, was to see if that would overcome and facilitate um, uh, men talking about prostate cancer experiences. So I'm going to stop talking because I've talked for long enough and I'm going to open up to my colleagues, uh, Janet and Kath, who are here, um, to kick us off on, on any thoughts they had about um, the content and um, the write-up, etc. Over to you guys. Um, in terms of, I suppose, if we're looking at benefits that struck struck me from, the, from it as an actual method, I think one of the main things that really um, sort of came out of the article for me was the ability to sort of get a greater deal of context from what they were trying to explain about their experience so that you perhaps wouldn't get from just doing a, an interview without those images because it enabled them, I think they talk in the article don't they about an eight, the photos enabled a, a different way of explaining what they meant by their experience, for example, of um, sort of sexual dysfunction or their sense of masculinity because they applied it to, uh, I think there was a, a photo that, that a man, one man linked around, you know, not being able to do gardening, gardening and things yeah. like that. So I think that was what struck me about yeah. it, that, yeah. that yes, you can get some context depending on how the interviewer chooses to explore yeah. something that someone might point to in an interview. But I think the photos sort of enabled a more richer yeah. explanation of that from by the patient mm -hmm. because it wasn't driven by perhaps some assumptions on the interviewer's part yeah. around what that particular experience yeah. meant for that put. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I, I would follow that up as well. I think because it's very much, the paper was very participant-led and I think it shows that this method um, is facilitates a participant-led mm. approach because they all had creative, they use the words creative control and freedom and um, I think they encourage people to use like a storyboard, as the process yes, as a storyboard yeah. and that became a useful tool in the interviews um, to help them narrate their, their story. Um, and so it was very much uh, participant-driven rather than researcher-driven. I think their open opening question was, uh, tell me about, tell me about this, this picture yes, and what does yeah. it say? Yeah. And I think the picture of the um, the chair in the garden, yes, it yeah. just needs the narrative of the interview, doesn't it? Because you does. kind of wonder what that's about. But the, the narrative that goes with it about not being able to do things that you would normally do mm. and being frustrated by that. And the, the kind of um, magazine that was on the chair that actually you couldn't see that. When I looked at the picture, yes. I didn't see that at all yeah. the first time. Um, and uh, which was about men's health and how um, he found great um, benefits from, from reading such, um, such magazines at that time. Um, the other thing as well is they, they kind of do mention a lot and you kind of got this feeling as you, as you read the article that the use of photos helped the participants overcome potential barriers perhaps to... Um, finding the right words if, if it was just um, interviews alone. Yes, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think it was that thing of... Um, that I'm trying to find the example they gave and I can't find it at the moment, but 
there's that thing of you can still um, undertake a very open interview, can't you, with a very open question at the start. But I think you got the sense that the photos... Um, so that, that person might have started off with the same exact yeah. narrative, regardless of which method was used, with, it, with or without photos. But you got the impression that the photos added a, a further layer to the, yeah. the explanation of their experience. I mean, in terms of the actual benefits, I suppose, and, and you can't know for certain how their stories compared with those that didn't use photos, because yeah. that's not covered in the article, is it? No. But I think the examples that they give throughout the article do help to explain. Yeah. There's clear examples in the article, isn't there, that you can really fully appreciate that wouldn't have come out if, if the photos hadn't have, have been there. So, Definitely. I yeah. think that's a really, a really striking... Um, there's some striking examples of the way in which the photos allowed access to quite intimate areas, mm -hmm. experiences um, that participants were experiencing that it's hard to imagine would have been uncovered in yeah. quite as much depth. So, for instance, the photograph of the guy wearing the yeah. pouch, the absorbent pouch. Yes, yeah. Um, and how he may or may not have spoken about incontinence without the images, but, you know, um, the I sense is it's it, embellished. It is, and I, I think it does, and it adds a powerful dimension to... Um, so as, as medical practitioners we talk about that incontinence in a medical mm. way but what we don't what you can't get um, from that talking about incontinence is the impact of what it physically means that he yeah. had to wear something yeah. every day and, and, and the impact that has so it has a very powerful um, message and, does, yeah. and I think the other, the, the similarly the, the picture of the um, patient lying on the radiotherapy treatment yes. bed, and and I was interested in the the discussion around that and how they'd use that image in some um, presentation they'd use with, with nurse student nurses, and they picked up on the fact that um, his trousers being left that low down, his ankles provided no dignity, and what were they there for? And the cut towel again, it was not very dignified, and I thought that was really really interesting and. Um, again a very powerful um, message for that participant to portray to healthcare practitioners um, in a very technology focused area of radiotherapy mm -hmm. um, where obviously lining them up and the lasers and everything is really important but that aspect of, of, of what it feels like to have to be laid there your ankle you know trousers around your ankles um, is something that maybe we, we put we don't see because um, we're so focused on the technology aspects and seeing it in a photograph like that um, uh, kind of reinforce even though they see, they see that every day it's, you know, but um, different groups of some nurses clearly picked up on that as, yeah. As, um, yeah. and I think in that what the nurses were doing as well was that they were understanding the patient experience from the eyes of the, exp the, the person that had experienced it weren't they, through the the access to that photo, a bit like if um, you had a patient come and speak at a study day, it's very motivational to learn directly from that person, isn't it? And I think that's kind of one of the benefits they discuss is that that's lost, isn't it, without the, the photos, because ultimately it's the researcher that will um, interpret from the, the text and the interview transcript their own interpretation of the the participants experience and those individual examples are almost lost a bit aren't yeah, they yeah. within the the researcher's own interpretation of of the the patient experience more generally Definitely. and, it, and um, yeah i think in the context of giving examples when you're reporting on the patient experience to have the photos still there mm. is a really useful way of Highlighted, they talked, didn't they, about when they came to write up their findings, yes. it, how useful it was to have the photos as a as an example of what they were trying to explain yeah. Yeah. around a theme that they pulled yeah. out, rather than just putting in what would normally be participant quotes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Added which depth, still added. are limited in what they show, mm. aren't they? Certainly, um, yeah. And perhaps, um, and they do talk about this, the the notion that. 
the photographs, the data effectively continues to be interpreted mm. by new audiences. Isn't yes, it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Whether that's at conferences or exhibitions, and um, so there's never it's not it's not static. There's yeah. an ongoing interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, it sort of benefits across the whole research process, really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That, that sort of a, a taking it right to the end of that knowledge transfer yeah. to a wider audience and having an impact yeah. is arguably more impactful, isn't it, as a piece of research? Yeah. 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 And I know that the researchers set the scene for participants by asking them to imagine that they were yes. doing an exhibition, which I thought was curious. Um, Rather than sort of saying, let's, you know, this is because effectively that's what they have done, isn't it? Yeah. It is essentially yeah. Yeah. through conferences. And uh, I thought, the no- just as an aside, really, I thought the notion of asking, pretending it was they were being paid to do it, I couldn't, um, I thought that was an interesting concept about yeah. So that is an aside, but I thought yeah. that was curious about yeah. it. I picked up on that as well, and, and, I, and I think what I thought about that was that actually it made it even more open, didn't it, at the start, because they didn't sort of even really give them any brief at all did they in terms of these are our aims from our research that we want you to then focus on and share they sort of literally just left it really open didn't they as to what what they ultimately chose to share about their experience they didn't it didn't seem like they'd ask them to focus on particular no aspects that they obviously knew were issues yeah but they didn't yeah. ask them to specifically focus on one particular side effect or one particular treatment they no. just allowed them I to. think it was really positive as well that they um, had said um, that no picture or image um, was, was banal that yeah. um, you know to give people you know it can be anything yes, absolutely yeah. anything yeah. and it doesn't it, it doesn't have to be fancy mm-hmm. or super creative mm-hmm. and and I think that's um, a thing that we might come on to in a, min- in a minute when we talk about some of the drawbacks of the difficulties of this method um, is that sometimes patient- the participants might fear that they're not creative enough mm-hmm. um, to produce something um, in you know that's worthy of a research project um, and I think they try to reinforce that with the process of selection and meeting mm-hmm. them um, and consenting yes, to, yeah. to, to say nothing is too plain mm-hmm. or boring or anything mm-hmm. it's about what it means to you and the narrative around it, which I thought was really, really positive. And that example of the chair in the garden is actually potentially yeah. an example of that, because without the context, mm. you know, you perhaps mm. glance at that and not think much about it, but that, that participant spoke for 20 minutes to that photograph. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's good how the both of them both yeah, together, absolutely. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, um, is there any other positives, opposite, or do we want to talk about... Um, some of the difficulties. Just one positive was yeah. about um, the rapport yeah. and the ability for rapport between research and participant because they had to um, have um, repeated contact in terms of dropping off cameras yeah. or picking them up. Yeah. But also that option, that that opportunity for the participants to re- reflect prior to the interview. Mm-hmm. So they came to the interview. Yes. Yeah. Prepared. Red. And yeah. that's, that's yeah. Seems yeah. huge. You yes. know. Yeah. Um, normally it's like, what's going to happen? What, like, what am I going to be asked? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas they came with, yeah, with their and I story. think that, that is another point that comes out from their description of the, of, of the process is that um, it was an aid memoir as well. Also, yeah. whereas if you're in an interview uh, with a participant, sometimes you give them a question and they've got to remember mm, yeah. what it was like, and they might yeah. not have thought about it before they come for the interview. Yeah. So it's very difficult for them to recall exactly. Um, but by taking the photographs, they've had time to think, mm-hmm. and they do talk about it being a very tactile process mm-hmm. where they were handling the photographs and mm-hmm. pointing, mm-hmm. and um, and it's a, it seems like a much more um, relaxed and not putting the participants on the spot kind of thing that they've actually prepared. It's what they they brought, um, they they brought it and they're prepared to talk mm-hmm. about it, and then and it's things that they're prepared to talk about to as share, well. Yeah. To share. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and they will have had time to think about the language. I think one of the participants um, talked in particular language about how he was able to distance himself from a little bit from some some yeah. aspects that he didn't want to think about and yeah. talk about. You know, maybe later on in the, the sort of patient pathway and care. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really beneficial then because you're not asking the patient to go participant to go somewhere um, that's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. They've chosen. What they're going to go yeah. to, and um, 
So yeah, you're right, that's another positive. Mm. I think in relation to that as well and what they chose to share, I think it's um, they another benefit that they point out is that it enabled them to understand what was the, the biggest, in, in, you know, impactful um, factors on their experience, wasn't it? So, again, like, um, all men might experience the same thing, but it, it might mean more yeah. to some yeah. as opposed to others, oh, yeah, and absolutely. based on what they choose to share, yeah. gave the researchers an insight into what was most... Yeah poignant for them along the way yeah. Yes. Yeah, which may have been lost in a yes, in a yeah, that just sort of with semi structured yeah, questions yeah. that sort of strength of feeling around yeah. an emotion around something yeah. Yeah. We've talked a lot about the positives, and um, and there are a lot of positives for this method. Um, but this method is not without its challenges and difficulties. And I think um, if we can talk about some of those, um, so they, the, the researchers do talk um, a little bit about ethics and confidentiality. So clearly, one of the difficulties around getting participants to um, use photo, uh, use visual methods, but particularly photo methods is about the confidentiality of the participants themselves. So the guy who took a, got his wife to take a picture of him in this kitchen, he, he, he didn't have his head on, mm-hmm. so he couldn't be um, identified. Um, but also, if you're wanting to take um, photographs of a family gathering, for example, because that's important to you, um, you know, as a researcher, you need to be very aware of whether whether he or she has gathered consent from those people to be in that photograph. Does it contain children? Um, you know, are they identifiable? Do they want to be identified? So the whole bag of complexities around ethics and consent of people. And, um, and particularly um, in hospitals, you have to be very careful about what, you, what images you take in, in the hospital environment. Lots of trusts and hospitals have rules about what you can and can't take photos of because of confidentiality, just in case um, some of the patient's notes happen to have been left on the side and it's got the name written all over it, that, that kind of thing. Um, so there is all of that detail that a researcher has to really think carefully about before they embark on it, how they're going to get those messages across in a patient information sheet without it being overly complex and difficult. Um, And um, the consent process um, can be quite complex. I'm going to refer to Janet here because I know Janet is using this method in her her PhD work. Um, And you've got various layered um, consent processes, haven't you? That's right, that's right. So initial consent to um, participate in the study and undertake an interview But later on, there will be a second consent process um, that will look at whether participants would like any or any of their photographs to be reproduced and in what context. Um, And that's simply because it's about informed consent, isn't it? Mm. And obviously at the point at which there are no photographs in existence Mm. for the study, participants don't know what they're agreeing to, so... So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I think it's important to revisit that because they would have taken their photographs to demonstrate their experience, mm-hmm. um, but then there's a difference between what you're willing to share with the researcher mm-hmm. and what you're willing to, to say, share in a peer-reviewed publication mm-hmm. or in an exhibition yeah. might be different. And I think these authors did this, actually. I think they, um, which is why they didn't put lots and lots of images in, and some of them were um, really just for the report and not for wider dissemination, mm-hmm. that they... Um, you need to have that conversation and that opportunity mm-hmm. for participants to own um, what what goes in where mm-hmm. um, in the dissemination mm-hmm. process. And it's not that straightforward. It's not just a line you can put on an information sheet. It gets really complicated. So that has to be built into the process, doesn't it? Really? It does. And there's co- copyright issues. Yeah. So whether people are drawing upon um, internet images yeah. or using their own. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Studies vary. Some researchers um, have copyright um, given over to the researcher and others leave the copyright with the, with the participant. So there's different ways of managing it, but yeah, yeah. it needs to be really, really clear. Yeah. And, you know, it, everybody needs to understand. Yes, yes, and the, the sort of legal as yeah. well as ethical issues. Yeah. 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 Are there any other... I mean, Janet, you're a bit of the expert yeah, here. So. But just thinking about the practicalities. Yeah. So, for instance, using um, lots of people use digital cameras or their, certainly their own smartphones now. But for 
ethical purposes for the storage and um, collection and storage of photographs. Um, my original intention was to use a disposable camera, and that's not without its difficulties. Um, so, some, for instance, the participants just returned one to me with a note saying, forgot to put the flash on a few times. <laughs> so they're, they're being developed at the moment, and I, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm sort of, you know, so the, there's issues about quality and participants being anxious about the quality of their pictures. Mm -hmm. And I don't know at this stage whether those pictures will be, you know, we'll, whether we'll be able to see what's in the images. But um, feeling fairly relaxed about it, because I think you just have to go with it and, yeah. then, and reassure participants that yeah. it's, they're a trigger for conversation, aren't they? Yeah. And, yeah. and even in the absence of what might be seen to be a yes. picture, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's about enriching the, yeah. the conversation, isn't it? I think that's another um, complexity that we do have to be mindful of is I know with your study, Janet, that you put a lot of thought into how um, you re maintain confidentiality and um, uh, uh, um, ethical good practice mm -hmm. if, you, if people are bringing it on their smartphone mm -hmm. and how, that, how those images are transferred and where they're stored mm -hmm. is a really big issue um, in terms of data protection and... Um, uh, making sure that they're on a really secure yes. um, file electronically that is only viewed by the researcher yeah. um, and or um, a member of the, of the research team. Um, so all of that is a really, it, the practicalities of setting up a study must not be, un <laughs> you can't okay. underestimate it, it's, it's, it's a really big deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are some huge benefits to this method. But we mustn't uh, forget about how the, the practicalities of, of doing all this safely and um, mm. with good ethical and research practice is, is um, uh, it, it needs to be taken into account, really, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and it's a blessing and a curse for the internet because it's made all sorts of things accessible, but actually potentially, mm. the, you know, the potential for uh, being distributed in, in yeah. unwanted ways as well. So, yeah, I mean, there are processes and ways of encrypting it but um, yeah it's, yeah it's and, and, and I think there is a difficulty there isn't it if, if, if participants um, want I've seen an image on the internet there they think that perfectly describes how I felt at that time and they want to use it um, but you you then can't reproduce it because it's not yours to, it's not yes. anybody theirs to when it's the original yes. persons um, and um, and that becomes difficult if you're wanting to present your work mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a powerful image yeah. with the narrative, yeah. but you can't put that, that image up to your audience because you haven't got the copyright to do so. Yes. Um, so that is a drawback that you kind of um, have to think, think yes. a little bit about, isn't it? And, yes, um, and that's exactly something that I am yeah. encountering. So one participant brought a family photograph. She brought um, some that she'd taken, but she also brought some off the internet. Um, and yeah, absolutely, some powerful images. But yeah, yeah. so whether yeah. I try and find them and check the copyright on those, or whether we seek yeah. something else, or yeah. whether I get somebody to draw one Reform. for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. That's, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I might need to sort of think yeah. about that if it's a particularly powerful image and mm -hmm. copy, you know something that needs to, that we could do with you know that the participant wants represented yeah. um, visually. Then there's another way of doing yeah. that. I think one of the things that we touched on a little bit is the fact that they had access to 35 participants in the bigger study and only 19 yes. came forward and um, there might be lots and lots of reasons for that um, but one of the potential things that we've talked about before mm -hmm. Janet is that um, a lot of people feel they're, they're not they're not creative enough to do an image um, and so it, it, does that then limit um, accessibility um, and people being able to narrate their stories and their experiences because of the fear or this belief that actually they can't contribute because it's a mm. photo or visual method study. Mm. Um, and I know we together have had lots of conversations about that, haven't we? And, um, and do you want to talk about yeah. what you've done in your study? So my, my, sense, my sense is, because I've originally thought about opening up to drawings or mm. other, other artistic means, um, but actually came full circle to thinking actually in some ways photography is, um, you know, widespread, everybody mm -hmm. uses photographs every day, it's something that, compared to drawing that perhaps requires less skill um, but um, yeah, we got around that really by giving women uh, who took participate in my particular study the option of either using a set of photographs that I've already got prepared that they can select from or taking their own or um, using 
existing photographs. So yeah. it's about widening the option as much as possible, or indeed not using photographs at all. So um, yeah, not cornering, not yeah. sort of cornering women or excluding women who might yes. want to take part. And I think it's a difficult one, but I think some people simply aren't visual um, thinkers. Or if they are, or if we all have the capacity to be, I think, put on put in the position of saying, hey, do you want to take part in a study? How about using photographs? Mm-hmm. It's, it doesn't float everybody's boat, and I mm-hmm. think you just have to respect that. Does yeah. your study include women, then, that uh, you, you will be interviewing in a more traditional way? If, that, that didn't if, that's, want yeah, to, if that's what they've chosen to so, do. So you've, yeah. you've sort of... Um, there's that, I suppose, it, it's not a, a method, an exclusive method that yeah. should be conducted alone without any other yeah. methods it's just a I suppose that's the benefit of it isn't it yeah. it's because some people don't want to come and do a yeah. an interview in a formal yeah. setting if they don't feel prepared yes. Yes. so exactly. it's about it, increasing it inclusivity is, it is, you know or, is, or for patients that find it difficult to articulate their thoughts that maybe would sometimes need to therefore be excluded from yeah. a, a yeah. research project, yeah. it perhaps opens it up to more, I think more minority um, groups. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah, yes. We've talked a lot about making it um, not um, exclusive yeah. and, um, and how you en- en- enable people who, in, in, in Janet's study, we're talking about women who've been essentially silenced because mm. they, they, they don't really have a voice. Um, and if you're kind of saying, well, it's photo photo only <laughs> are you <laughs> limiting yeah, those, uh, those, some of those people and we also talked about well actually is it too you've mentioned just now about um where the, are there other creative methods mm-hmm. actually that some women might be more comfortable with like maybe writing poetry but then it becomes vast and, mm-hmm. and in, in one in a small study essentially with a phd it becomes too big and you you can dilute something mm-hmm. to the point of it doesn't have any value mm-hmm. um and one of the aims or uh, uh, of the study was also to look at well actually can um, photo or visual methods help mm-hmm. women so that is one of the, the aims yeah. so so we you haven't gone down the route of oh, stories no. poems mm-hmm. but that is an option that mm-hmm. is a creative yeah. option that might give participants um, another avenue mm-hmm. rather than just coming like you say to, yeah. to an interview yeah. and just having to recall things and remember things I'll be putting on a spot or, or where the questions aren't really they don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about something else yes. linked to the study, linked to the topic area, but um, but it's very researcher-driven in the interview. Um, so that's just something to think about, isn't it? And we, we, in, you and I and the team, we made a specific decision in the end because you had to, you had to hone it down and make yeah. it doable. Otherwise, yeah. it becomes too vast with the resources that you've got available yeah. Yeah. to make it doable in yeah. the time frame. Yeah. It's certainly very interesting to open yeah. it up to poetry yeah. and... And maybe um, something for the future in a follow on study or something. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think um, when you come to do the interviews with them, and do you think you will approach the interview differently with those that haven't done the photos? Yeah. Because yeah. you almost have to, it can still be very open, but there has to be some yeah. sort yeah. of structure there more yeah. so perhaps than those that have come with a story already ready to mm. share. That you could sort of, I can imagine you getting straight on with saying yeah. to them, yeah. tell me about these pictures yeah. then or are you going to sort of still ask the same questions of both but then get them to bring in the photos as they answer your questions do you see to me? I do, it's a good yeah. question I've, I've done a few interviews yeah. already and um, they felt very similar in tone interestingly oh, right. so I, I think yeah. even um, so one I've done five interviews one woman chose not to use photographs at all and I think, to be fair, although we talked about photographs helping people prepare and reflect and think about it, I think that does actually happen as well in traditional yes, interviews. Yeah. And um, so it was simply an open-ended question, to, so tell me anything you'd like to share yes, with me about yeah. your experiences. And that's all that was required. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have two or three questions I ask everybody at the end. Um, if if the to- if those particular topics haven't come up, but it it was still yeah it still felt so it's still essentially leaving it with that very yeah. open question at the start yes and, and then obviously some would use the photos to yeah. answer that open, open question and others wouldn't yes yeah. yeah so still agenda setting on yes. the part of the participant yeah yeah, yeah. 
just going back to what you said about potential disadvantage, one perhaps for me unexpected, um, quite sort of strong response um, against photographs from one participant who felt that it was quite um, demeaning to ask being asked to use photographs because they felt it was implying that they weren't able to give a good enough account verbally and that actually photographs was, would actually be normally used to support somebody who may have difficulty articulating themselves. Uh, so it could so be that really yeah. interesting that, yeah. about, um, about assumptions that perhaps we all bring. Yeah. Yes, about, about the role of images. The role of yeah. images, thinking yeah. that's a really positive thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. when actually it's about how it's perceived. How it's perceived by, by people. people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a yeah. valuable thing to share actually, mm-hmm. isn't it? To make sure um, that you somehow have to narrate and articulate that as part of the build up to the discussion with the participant isn't it that um, it's to facilitate not because we think you can't speak (laughs) and narrate it Um, that's right so however um, encouraging you think your invitation material for the study might be it can be it can be taken uh, read in different 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 ways so for this particular person it was seen as quite demeaning and patronising which I you know which I hadn't obviously hadn't Anticipated, I wouldn't, yeah. you know, yeah. deliberately done that. So, but that's really what is important to know, isn't yeah, it? it is. People will yeah. read things differently. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else? Nothing that immediately springs to mind. I don't think. I don't think so. I just, um, just thought it was a fab. A fab yeah. article. Yeah. I think I think it's a fab article, and I would I would suggest to any of our students or listeners that you try and read this because um, it just give an insight. Um, into particularly prostate cancer patient um, experiences um, of care, of what they're going through, of side effects. Um, uh, and, yeah, I just think... I, I thought it was a fab article. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, and it's been a bit of a departure from us because we normally do this about critical appraisal and then I've kind of highlighted why I think that it wasn't the focus of the mm-hmm. study. Really. It was about the method, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope, you fa- I hope you find this interesting... Um, uh, for us to talk about a, a method, that research method that doesn't um, really it's not been in any of the other podcasts that we've done, we've not you looked at um, photo or visual methods before and I think um, it has a really valuable place particularly, uh, in lots of things actually, but particularly in cancer care I think, and um, I think it's becoming more prominent isn't it, I think we, we are aware of lots of um, uh, people who document their stories online through visual methods. Um, there's a number of patients online that you can access by Twitter who document their experiences through either photos, photo documentation, or through um, art. I know of mm-hmm. one lady who's um, yeah. an artist who's um, really demonstrated her feelings and experiences throughout the whole of her cancer journey, and it's really enlightening. Um, as a health professional to see that um, and really useful. So I hope you've um, found our discussion uh, today interesting and I hope you're listening to the next one in our podcast series. Thank you.